So a week ago, I made a short called, Can You Define God? What? No. Which was a fun poke at how cute humans are, trying to use words to put definitions on the infinite supreme oneness. It's cute because, as Hermes says in the Hermetica, the imperfect and impermanent, that's us BT dubs, cannot easily apprehend the eternally perfected. And, well, okay, that's true. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try, right? Especially if we're on the journey to embody that eternal perfected oneness. Through all the resources available, such as going within, scripture, prayer, psychedelics done with devotional intent, or just plain learning from each other and our shared collective experiences, all ultimately helps to point our mind toward the experience of connecting with the divine. But we have to be careful too, because the more words that we add, do we actually get closer to God or farther away? Really, it depends on where we're speaking from, where the source of the words come from. And so you see the fun fallacy here, right? Can anyone really describe God? Maybe all of us can, to the degree in which we're able to embody it. Now, for many people today, there's a lot of simple descriptors that are often drawn upon. Love, unity, source, all, consciousness, spirit, Christ. Personally, I've been very interested in reading both Eastern and Western scriptures lately, finding value in the Bible, the Upanishads, and the Bhagavad Gita. In the most major Eastern and Western traditions, God is often described through sacred geometry, known as the Trinity or Trimurti. Now this is probably common knowledge today, but the Trinity in the West is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in the East, it's the forces of the creator, preserver, and destroyer. Now, as I was going through the Bible, I also took some time to enjoy Jordan Peterson's biblical lecture series. Very profound stuff. And in the end of his first class, he breaks down an idea cloud of the biblical trinity, which is an excellent place to start in understanding this concept. All credit to Mr. Peterson for this list specifically. Now, starting with the Father, this aspect is very unique. You can enter into a covenant with it. It responds to sacrifice and prayers. It transcends time and space. It punishes and rewards, and judges and forgives. It is also beyond nature, which is very interesting. Closeness with it is heaven, distance from it is hell. It is also the law. Curiously, both the Kabbalists and the writings of Hermes and Thoth describe God as the law, or a set of laws upon which the foundations of reality are writ. So what is God? Why can't we see him if he does exist? It's a law. You see a law when it's already realized in some kind of matter, when it acts, when you see its actions already. But we don't see it in and of itself. But we can't see God himself. Do we see gravity? Now the sun aspect is different. It is relative to language and vibration, the word of God. According to Hermes, the word of God is the harmonization of all things with all things and it speaks chaos into order, into harmony. It is the body and blood of Christ. It is the tragic victim and scapegoat and the eternally triumphant redeemer simultaneously, which can rescue from hell. Now the Kabbalists, especially Christian and Hermetic Kabbalah, describe that the word or son of God is nested on Tiferet on the tree of life, which is this center point at the middle of everything. But more importantly, it's the transition point between formless energy into substance with form and back again. The sun therefore plays out a role of death and rebirth. He dies and is reborn and is the king of kings and hero of heroes. And finally, the Holy Spirit aspect of this Trinity is far more mysterious and to me sounds like a feminine aspect. It's akin to the human soul, the prophetic still small voice or the spoken truth. It is called forth by music. It's the enemy of deceit, arrogance, and resentment. It is known as the water of life and blinding light that burns without consuming. And so you start to see the fallacy of attempting to describe God, right? I mean, I'm doing it anyways, but yet can we really know God inside by just studying this list? But we're only half done with our trinities. The Eastern Trinity is called a Trimurti, and these aspects of God are often described as the forces beyond creation and working through all things in reality. Brahma is the force of creation in the universe, 
He is called the father of fathers, the golden fetus, or the architect of the universe. Brahma, however, isn't really worshiped so much today. The idea was that he created everything and then left the rest to the others. There's also some mythology where he screwed up a bit and got one of his five heads cut off by Shiva and is still in the process of redeeming himself today. Then we have Vishnu, who is the preserver and protector of creation. This force of preservation is one which keeps and maintains harmony in the cosmos. And then when things grow out of balance, Vishnu will incarnate himself into a form necessary to help bring harmony back to creation. As an example, Vishnu, the force of preservation, is said to have incarnated nine times in Earth's history, with his last two incarnations being as Krishna and Buddha, with a 10th prophesied to come at the end of a major cosmic cycle called the Kali Yuga. It's very similar to the idea of Christ returning at the end of time. And then finally, there is Shiva, the force of the destroyer. Shiva is interesting because just as he is known as the destroyer, he is also known as the redeemer. There is a familiar idea here like Jesus who said, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword implied as a division between belief and unbelief. Shiva too destroys the old and is the force that brings renewal and restoration to that which was no longer working. Now, personally, and because I'm a bit of a rebel who doesn't like to glue myself to one specific tradition or another, I like to envision these two trinities like this. When they unite as such, we get the image of the Star of David or the Merkaba, the chariot of ascension. By understanding the lenses through which God can be known, we ourselves align our own body of consciousness with the very vehicle used to attain to the higher worlds. The collection of all three of the Trimurti together are called Brahman, the supreme ultimate reality, and are represented by the AUM, reflecting the Trimurti in three letters, though pronounced more like OM, which is the sound or word of creation. The link here from AUM in the West is the Amen, the resonant sound of the Lord. And as such, the Trinity in the Western understanding of God is said to be produced by the word of God, the vibration of creation. You're probably familiar with John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. How very interesting the use of the word with, much like you might say a woman is with child. In the beginning was the word, the vibration, and the word was with, God. The Word produced God. The One produced the Trinity. Curiously, the Hebrew name of God, YHVH or yud -Hey vav -Hey, sometimes pronounced as Yahweh, when written vertically, produces an image that looks like a man. And this is said simply to be the supreme being from which all comes. The unity that produces the multiplicity of all creation, which cannot be described or defined but through complete devotion to this supreme absolute reality being oneness that we are intrinsically a part of, one can come to embody it and in this become equivalent in form. So I guess that really falls on each of us to ask, do we want to become the embodiment of an ultimate divine consciousness? This is a full-fledged video at this point. I'm not holding anything back. We're going the distance in describing God. So in the spirit of that endeavor, I wanna to read to you this passage from the Hermetica, an ancient writing translated to the modern tongue by the wonderful Timothy Freak and Peter Gandy. God is whole and constant. In himself, he is motionless, yet he is self-moving. He is immaculate, incorruptible, and everlasting. He is the supreme ultimate reality. He is filled with ideas which are imperceptible to the senses and with all embracing knowledge. God is primal mind. He is too great to be called by the name God. He is hidden, yet obvious everywhere. His being is known through thought alone, yet we see his form before our eyes. He is bodiless, yet embodied in everything. There is nothing which he is not. He has no name because all names are his name. He is the unity in all things, and so we know him by all names and call everything God. Whoosh, everything is God. So like, seriously, is there any point to try and describe God? 
From that perspective, I'm God, you're God, this Shutterstock background behind me is God, and I'm actually on a green screen, which is also God. The thoughts that you're thinking right now? God also. The chaos in your life? God truly indeed. Though perhaps yet to be ordered by the word of God, which also seems to reside both within you and in the collective conscious imagination, or beyond it as Jesus, maybe. Who then, you know, is also God. So it's like, yeah, you can describe God. Literally everything. And then from this orgasm of the mind, when you see all things as God, and then you come down from this mental and emotional high, and you end up realizing and thinking about it and say, well, wait, what was the point of any of this? How does this help me? And ultimately, that's really about your personal relationship with God, isn't it? I mean, what is God to you? Personal or impersonal? Within you or without you? Everywhere or nowhere? Is God all of the above of everything I've just said? Or am I just a raving animated lunatic? And so, look, there's no real way to close this conversation. This is Pandora's box. The internet will be forever unable to return to the point before this video was made and a little blue guy told everybody that they were one with each other, and he certainly wasn't the first guy to do so. You can't unring the bell. And a lot of people are ringing a lot of bells right now. But you can pretend you didn't hear it for a while, I guess. At the beginning of this video, I asked if when we added more words, did we really get any closer to God? This is going to be up to you after... Wait, let me check here. So word count... 1867 words. Here we are, almost 2,000 words along. Are any of us closer to God? Perhaps it is such that the answer is yes. And there is still infinity beyond us on this journey to be closer. Ha, is all I have to say about that. Personally, I think nothing says this better than the opening of the Tao Te Ching. Lao Tzu hits it on the head when he says, the Tao that can be expressed is not the eternal, unchanging Tao. Just as an idea expressed in words is not the eternal idea it reflects. No matter how we try to describe the infinite totality, we are still physically embodied as finiteness, who through thought and spirit stretch into infinity. God must be experienced to truly be known. And while that's your own personal journey, it's also our collective journey too, wouldn't you say? I mean, I don't know about you, but when I open my eyes every morning and look out into the world, I see a giant field of collective consciousness vibrating together and manifesting a great shared reality field on an upwards journey of self-realization that sometimes also drags us into hell. And it's like a crazy roller coaster trip that just doesn't seem to end. Hey, thanks for watching. Today, I'm excited to share with you this brand new Aquarian edition of the Tao Te Ching. My attempt to render the ancient wisdom into a simple yet elegant reading fit for the modern mind. The Tao, translated as The Way, is a collection of over 81 verses that specifically explain the mystic way of heaven and nature, and how we can follow this pathway towards enlightenment, peace, and harmony in our lives. You might already know this, but there are many different versions of the Tao, and not all of them are quite easy to understand, and often they deviate even from the source material, injecting the author's interpretation instead. For the Aquarian edition, my intention was to create a Tao Te Ching that was as close to the original as possible, but also easy to follow. Sometimes both the verbatim translations from Chinese and the interpreted translations are a bit heady or out there. And so this new, original yet simple reading of the Tao helps you to have a fresh, modern experience of the classic Tao Te Ching. While there are many editions out there and plenty of versions to explore, I believe you're going to get a lot of value out of this new Aquarian edition. To celebrate the launch of this book, we are giving away lifetime memberships to our community, Spirit Mysteries, along with every order. You're invited to check out this book 
say hello in the community, and really dive deep into the mysterious way within. Use the link in the description to get the new Aquarian edition of the Tao Te Ching, and thanks for taking the time to tune in with me here today. See you again soon.